I want to explain to you just the term drawdown. Drawdown, uh, in the context of climate, refers to that first time when greenhouse gases peak and go down on a year-to-year -year basis. So that is what drawdown is. It comes from a conclusion I made in 2001, which the goals that we are naming with respect to climate change were rather weak need. Uh, mitigation, reduction, slowing, um, all these terms didn't make sense to me given the gravity of the situation and, and what we knew from the science. And so I began to bandy this term around. People looked at me sort of, and my, my friends and NGOs and scientists said, you know, we're very polite but didn't say anything about it because the IPCC and the goals have been really around stabilization and stabilization in 2050, whatever. What made a very big impression on me was this trip I took in 2009 to the North Greenland Emian Ice Research Station, which is in the very north of Greenland. Um, this is pretty much all it is, except for an ice cave, which I'll show you. I went there with the uh, Crown Prince of Norway, Crown Prince of Denmark, and the Crown Princess of Sweden. So it was a royal fact-finding journey. They took one journalist um, and six scientists. Uh, and we went there to really look at the science. What is going on with respect to the science of climate change? This is what it's like in summer. <laughs> you can only go there in the summer. And I won't um, bore you with this too much. When you go there, you sleep outside in tents at minus 20 degrees, you know, in a sleeping bag. And um, I can tell you when you have to get up in the night and pee, it is just awful. Um, and uh, this looks like a sort of a B-grade scientific, you know, sci-fi movie, which you're seeing here. Um, they drill down uh, 2,500 meters eventually to bedrock to really research um, the Emian period 125,000 years ago. Um, and I will skip to that. And this is the ice cores that come up. It's just amazing because the only lubricant that won't uh, mangle the data that comes up from the ice cores is coconut oil coconut milk. And so when these things come up from a thousand meters up, they're, they're steaming and bubbling with this white viscous liquid. You go, whoa, <laughs> it's like something from the deep, but it's actually coconut oil. And um, extraordinary science, and this is what the science is about. We as human beings have never existed here above 300 ppm until 1940. Not in a primate form, any other form that you think of humans being human. Uh, and so we're in Terra Nova, and what you see, of course, is a famous Al Gore step ladder in Inconvenient Truth, you know, which is a straight line up in carbon emissions, um, starting um, <clears throat> there. But going back to the circle period, that is the Emian period, and that, e that period, 125,000 years ago, there was hippopotami and uh, crocodile lounging in the Thames River Delta. Here, the water was 20 feet higher than it is right now. There was lions and giraffes in Germany. There was uh, alligators in Alaska. It was a very different regime than we have today. Um, and that was 285 ppm. We're at 402. If we count uh, methane, nitrous oxide, other greenhouse gases, the fluorocarbons, we're at 448. That seems to be missing in the dialogue. We're at 448, not 402. 402 is CO2, and that's the Mauna Loa uh, measurements, the Keeling curve. Um, so to me, this is what that trip to Greenland, and this is what uh, really, really emphasized to me that can we name the goal? And the goal cannot be stabilization, mitigation, reduction, slowing, continuous improvement. It just doesn't make sense. And the only goal that makes sense is to reverse it. Let's go the other way. If you're going down the wrong road, slowing down doesn't change the fact that it's the wrong road. You know, or another way to put it, um, if you're going over a cliff, slowing down just makes Thelma and Louise in slow motion. In other words, it's still going over the cliff. And so I wanted to name the goal. And what Project Drawdown about is about, I should go back before you read this little thing, is really about can we achieve it? I, I, I don't know. No one really has mapped measured or modeled the 100 most substantive solutions to global warming. It's never been done. After 40 years of the greatest crisis civilization has ever faced, we've never done that. Not the top 50, 40, 75, you name the number, we haven't done it. And so we set out to do it to see, in fact, what are they? If they scaled, and every one we measured is scaling, it's at hand, it's practiced, it's done, we know how to do it. 
if they scaled in a rigorous but reasonable way over 30 years, could we achieve that point where greenhouse gases peaked and began to go down on a year-to-year -year basis. That was the mandate, self-imposed mandate of Project Drawdown. When you go to the internet and you Google the top 10 solutions, and I Googled it from the UK just to see if it was any different from the US, it doesn't seem to be, uh, this is what you get. Put a power strip in your home entertainment center. I love that one. Um, lengthen airplane flights. I mean, this is really, this is from live science. I mean, you can read them yourself. So what happens is when individuals go and say, well, what can I do? What they get is a list of things they can't afford to do, or they get proverbs, you know, which is basically be efficient, eat smart, true, love your mother, should be up there as well. I mean, it's like, of course, but these aren't solutions. They're proverbs, or they're actually fantasies. Bury the carbon, build houses with trash. I mean, this is, so an individual looking at this feels kind of out of sorts. That is to say that the solutions proffered are not consequential to the problem as defined. And also, they get the news about global warming in this way. This is how you get it in the UK. It's just as bad in the US, only slightly different. And you get things like the headlines are accurate scientifically, but here it says wife smashes husband's head with frog ornament and kept it mummified in, in layers of sheeting for 18 years. In other words, you get clickbait next to these headlines as if they were commensurate in importance. And you see this over and over again. Like, here's a headline. Feel, if it, does it make you feel good? By the way, just click over here or go to the next page or wherever it is. Same thing, the real reason that so many women take so much time getting ready, you know, and we're talking about the death of the oceans. And here, there's 10,000 years. Like, so you read this in the morning and saying, ah, it's permanent for 10,000 years. In other words, game over, you know, and at the same time, they're asking you the 20 things you can do with Coca-Cola. And at least in this case, they're doing the right thing with Coca-Cola which is pouring it down the toilet, you know. So it is instructive in that way, but the point being is that the way individuals get information, not you, not you, but 99% of the world is getting information in very odd ways about climate change and global warming. So to begin, in order to do this, to map, measure, and model the 100 most substantive solutions, we had to figure out how to do it with no money. Um, and nobody wanted to give us the money to do it because we didn't have the expertise, frankly. Uh, I'm a journalist, I'm not a scientist. Uh, so we decided it had to be a coalition, it had to be a credible coalition of people from all over the world who do have PhDs, who, do have, uh, who are scientists, who are respected, who are IPCC lead authors, who do run companies, who do run governments, etc. So we put together a coalition and we put a call out all over the world to scholars at universities uh, to be Drawdown Fellows. And we got just extraordinary CVs. Um, these are White House Fellows, Aga Khan Award winners, Rhodes Scholars, etc. Half PhDs, 40% women, all have advanced degrees. And they became our core researchers. And to them, we added 128 advisors. Some of them are here in the room. So we had an advisory council. And on top of this, we had 40 outside expert scientific reviewers of the models themselves. Uh, so the idea was that uh, when we came together and published the book and published the data, that pretty much people would say, you did your homework, and that it was not one person or a small group doing the math. And that's what we did. We did the math. That's all we did. All the carbon data you see here is peer-reviewed science. We didn't take anybody's assertions, beliefs, or anything like that. All the financial numbers, which we also modeled, are taken from IEA, IPCC, the World Bank, uh, uh, Land Use, FAO, et cetera, et cetera, Reina, YASA. All the data we took from respected international institutions. So what we're doing here is reflecting back to the world what it knows. This isn't us telling the world what we know. This isn't about our group saying, we know this, you didn't, uh-uh. What we're saying is, this is what we know now, collectively. And we're just putting it together in a way that hasn't been put together before. And so this gives you an example, it's in, you'll see it in the book, the book has content, not just photos. Um, but we rank it by carbon impact, and there's only two things, of course, you can do about global warming. You can stop putting greenhouse gases up there. Conservation, right? efficiency, 
substitution of fossil fuels with renewable clean energy, or you can bring it back home, sequestration. There's only two things you can do. Um, this is the number, this is 16.6 .6 gigatons, metric tons of carbon emissions avoided with this technology by 2050. So that's what that number is, and that then determines the ranking number 16. We have net cost and net savings, and net cost being what? Against business as usual. The matrix you saw, which is, well, if we didn't do geothermal, would it be combined cycle gas? Would it be coal? What would we generate our electricity from were it not to be geothermal? And then, so in this case, you save money in the same way with in terms of total cost of uh, um, production is a $1.02 trillion savings uh, by 2050. So these are the, uh, the, the simple numbers in the book. In the data itself, we have RIR, ROI, we have first cost, we have a lot more economic data than in, is in the book itself. And I just want to go through solutions one very quickly just to give you a sense of the variety and the diversity of solutions that came up. And again, we didn't decide what they were. We went through probably 300 different solutions and then winnowed them out to be the ones that had the greatest impact. Uh, and that took about a year itself before we could actually model high-speed rail. This is indigenous people's land management by without question, the most effective managers of, of, of forest lands in the world are the people who have been there the longest. Um, and there's no second place when it comes to that. Uh, this is improved rice production. Rice is a, a, a major source of methane emissions. There's two methodologies that are being practiced that reduce those emissions by 50% and increase the productivity of rice production. You see zero cost. It costs nothing to do this. It just takes a farmer to walk across his or her field to the next farm uh, a rice paddy and teach them how to do it. So there's zero cost to this. Um, this is uh, uh, onshore wind. Again, in imagery, and Jeff said the only good slides were his, but I want to say we had some good slides ourselves. Um, but we wanted to show basically the scale here, rather, and we want to move away from the cliches uh, of imagery, you know, the polar bear looking confused on the ice floe floating away, you know, the calving iceberg, the vortice in the Atlantic Ocean in hurricane season, all these things are like, ah, come on. And this image, again, what you see is wind turbines on a beautiful grassy hill with wildflowers, children playing the background of blue sky, and that couldn't be a worse regime for a wind turbine. Like, this is, this uh, is the right regime for a wind turbine. This is uh, Sheringham Shoal off Norfolk in the North Sea. These are the Siemens 3 megawatt uh, wind turbines. This is where you want your wind power, <laughs> where the weather is really pissy, actually, <laughs> and, and not nice at all. Um, and as you can see here, and go back, I mean, wind is the number two solution. Look at the savings, uh, $7.43 trillion by 2050. It says billion, but that's a typo. It's trillion. This is billion. Uh, offshore, we, we model them differently because the costs are so different for these. This is uh, rooftop solar. Again, in terms of imagery, this is an Uros woman in Lake Titicaca living on a straw island with her two daughters. She has to replace the straw every 90 days or it sinks, the whole island sinks, and she's been using kerosene to light her home at night until this came. So again, we want to emphasize that these solutions are not just substitutions. It's not like, well, this works better, or this has a lower carbon footprint or something like that. These actually change people's lives. And if you look at these solutions, they're actually regenerative solutions. They regenerate ecosystems, societies, work. Uh, we'll get back to that in a minute. Um, this is forest protection, the Cromody Bear and the Great Bear Forest in British Columbia. Uh, Prince William was there last September to cut the ribbon. Finally, after 22 years of activism to save, I think it's 12 million hectare forest. I forgot the exact number. Clean cook stoves. This is about black carbon, which is a, a very short-lived but very, very powerful pollutant that uh, causes warming. This is number five solution, which is the protection, restoration of tropical forests. This one is household recycling. This is a Dasanak woman in Ethiopia. They built a bridge across from her village, and um, they built a bar for the men building the bridge. And then the women go over in the morning to the bar and pick up everything the men thrown away, which is bottle caps, SIM cards, and watch bands, whatever, and make uh, headdresses and jewelry, which they now sell to boutiques in France. So. Um, uh, 
Um, this is managed grazing. Again, I just want to go through these. This is an electric bike. This is the man who makes them in Berlin. This is biochar, terra preta, which goes back 500 at least years, maybe more, in terms of uh, human agricultural technology. It really is a technology. This gentleman here is in Montreal. He's uh, waving to Ivan from uh, Prague, and he's at uh, PwC, PricewaterhouseCoopers, the former accounting firm for the Oscars. And uh, this is telepresence, this is a transport solution. So Ivan in Prague can go to that office, log on, get on this little modified Segway scooter, and go around the office and go to your office, and say hello, and just show up at meetings. You can come in the door right now and ask questions and so forth. So this is uh, shipping ideas instead of protoplasm around the world. Um, and then we have about 20 coming attractions, and I won't go through many of them, just a couple. Coming attractions are solutions that are valid scientifically, but they have not been peer-reviewed. That is, they're so nascent, they're just on the horizon. In most cases, there's not economic data sufficient to model on the financial side, so they're, they're coming attractions. So there's no numbers you see with them. Marine permaculture is basically one kilometer square recycled PET frames um, sunk in the ocean, PET does not break down in salt water, so it's, you know, it's for some reason. Uh, but they have actuating pumps that bring up the thermocline, the cold nutrient-laden waters. Uh, the ocean, as you know, absorbs 97% of, of the global heat so far, global warming. 97% is going into water, not the land. And um, it's creating heat blankets, and so the normal uh, circulation patterns in, in the oceans are being disrupted, creating marine deserts. 99% of marine waters are deserts, literally, there's no life. And when you place these frames in there, and these have pumps that go up and down just from the uh, uh, rise and fall of the water, so they're actuated that way, they bring up these cold, nutrient-laden waters, and you get a trophic cascade of phytoplankton, zooplankton, um, you get uh, algae, you get kelp, you get feeder fish, you get forage fish, you get the whole uh, things you, which you just get, a, say, on a coral reef, uh, but you do it very, very quickly. Building with wood, building skyscrapers with wood is safer than buildings built of steel and concrete in fire. Go, no, 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 no. <laughs> it is. And you can read the studies from Yale and, and so forth. Europe really leads the way on this. Um, I think there's now a 15-story building in, in Scandinavia. Um, and they're going up to 30 stories, and they're uh, uh, extraordinary in terms of their impact on uh, overall emissions, and they're beautiful, and they're very light. Um, this is the last one I'll show you. A cow walks onto a beach. Again, I want to just emphasize that, you know, we're not, the 80 solutions that we model uh, are not the only thing that we can do in the next 30 years. Uh, there's this, uh, uh, we saw Peter uh, the Amanda's and X Prize. I mean, there's just a plethora of things coming up um, that are an innovative, imaginative, extraordinary, ingenious. This one uh, started at Prince Edward Island. This, as you can see, is not Prince Edward Island. This is barley, but <laughs> from a farmer named Joe Dorgan, who's a dairy farmer, he noticed that the cows, his dairy cows that ate seaweed, produced more milk. Okay, well, I think every farmer in Prince Edward Island is on a beach because it's so tiny, but, um, but the question is why? I mean, you know, and so he asked the county agent, or the agricultural agent, and he said, I don't know, and he got in touch with the scientist. The scientist said, well, it must have something to do with methane because methane is an enormously uh, inefficient process, a metabolic process for a ruminant, for a cow, uh, ca cattle, sheep, uh, goats. So let's find out. So they, they divided some of the, separated some of the cows and fed them kelp as they raked up from the beach. And sure enough, they put plastic bags on their head and measured the methane emissions five times a day from the exhalations, and there was a definite correlation. So the problem is, who can gather kelp all day and feed that to cattle? It's, it's a science project. It has no relevance to the world as a whole. But he, the scientist in uh, Canada then discovered a scientist in Australia at CSIRO who was doing the same work. And he discovered an algae called Asparagopsis taxiformis, which is fed in a 2% quantity in cattle food or any food to a ruminant, uh, reduces methane emissions by 70 to 90%. And as you know, cattle are one of the major sources of methane emissions. 
uh, in the world. Uh, so it has a profound impact. And what's so interesting about it is this guy is talking to this guy. And so <laughs> they actually met. The book came out April 18th, so this is it's really quick. But they're actually form a company so that they can make Asparagopsis taxiformis on the marine permaculture frames. And uh, this gives you a sense of the rate of innovation. Uh, in overall, and you'll see the whole list is in your book, but what surprised us uh, is that food was eight of the top 20 solutions. We did not see that coming at all. The number four solution is a plant-rich diet, which basically reduces animal protein in the northern or richer countries from uh, 100 grams average to about 50 grams, which is a healthy level unless you're a super athlete. Um, and it raises the protein content in those countries where people are uh, uh, not getting sufficient nourishment and also raises the caloric content. So it, it does both, it's not just one or the other. Uh, and yet it's the number four solution. And the number three solution is reduced food waste. And again, we did not see that coming. When we saw the numbers, we checked them over and checked them twice and checked them again, absolutely. This is actually low because what we're not counting is that when you waste food in most municipalities in the world, it goes into landfill. Landfill becomes anaerobic, it produces methane, and we don't even count that in this number because it was too difficult to calculate. Uh, but reduced food waste is an extraordinary uh, solution, or you can say a problem, which is the solution, and something you can do something about today, every meal you eat and what you buy. Um, and so you can see the food sector was larger than energy. I should say energy, it's really the electrical generation part of energy. Energy suffuses all of these, uh, transport, the built environment, obviously agriculture and so forth. So I don't want to say it's bigger than energy per se, but in terms of solutions. And you see like buildings and cities being small. Well, that's because many of the solutions there are in other areas, for example, transport. Refrigeration management turned out to be the number one solution, a single solution, which is hydrofluorocarbons because they're five to 9,000 times more powerful than CO2. Um, it's not something we need to do anything about because the world is doing a lot about it already. It's not a solution, it's begging for participants. It's really going. I, when we published the book, um, the, the whole refrigeration management industry in the United States got so excited. So we've already done 10,000 supermarkets. The best refrigerant to replace HFCs is CO2. <laughs> it's interesting. It's absolutely the best. Um, so, and this is energy was really five of the top 20. If you combine number 22, offshore wind, they become the number one solution, not refrigerant management. Um, and then this also surprised us. This is educating girls. And educating girls is very straightforward. I mean, we've understood for 40 years the implication of educate, uh, girls having the ability to educate, pro providing that education or not. Um, and in many countries, as you know, they're pulled out of school at puberty for cultural, familial, religious reasons or combination thereof. And they, um, their life is chosen for them in many ways, and definitely their reproductive, reproductive uh, rate. Uh, and those uh, girls, still girls, have an average uh, of, of, of five plus children. And if they're allowed to stay in school and supported to become a woman on their terms, their reproduction rate is two. So this is really, uh, and this, which is family planning, these two together really measure the difference between the UN high and median population in 2050, between 10.8 and 9.7 billion. This is straight up UN, World Bank, WHO numbers. They're not our numbers. And these are low numbers. These are low numbers. But if you combine them, empowering girls and women becomes the number one solution to addressing global warming. It's like... Yeah, and who knew? But the whole thing about this for us is who knew, who knew, who knew? And, and you know, um, we certainly didn't, by the way, and I just want to make that very clear. So many people come to me and say, oh, it's so ambitious. <laughs> I love that. It's like, let's just let civilization go. That seems to be a reasonable course, you know. <laughs> but what you're talking about is so ambitious, you know. And I'm going, oh, okay. But, is it possible? Well, yes, and this is why. You've, most of you have seen this. The, uh, it's old, it's dated 2006, but it's a NASA simulation of 
of carbon emissions over a period of 12 months and the it's color coded so the darker the red or the vermilion uh, and blood red whatever is the higher concentration of CO2 and it's winter time and you can see it building up in the north where it is winter and where most of the people are and um, and so it goes uh, until you hit May and June and when the leaves start to come out on the trees and the grasses grow and farmers are planting. In other words, photosynthesis kicks in in the north uh, starting in the spring and then you start to see blue and more blue and bigger patches of blue and less red and no red and less yellow. And what you see is a complete change in atmospheric concentrations of CO2. The point being is that every year we draw down six to seven ppm. So is drawdown possible? No, it, it's, it's happening. It's not, it's, it's not like, could we do it? It happens every single year. So the question really is about that balance between anthropogenic emissions, which are caused by fossil fuel combustion and land use and other greenhouse gas emissions, nitrous oxide, methane, etc., cetera, and uh, with what the Earth wants to do uh, on its own. And this is caused by basically these beautiful little things, stomata. This is our allies. This is what's on every leaf, twig, <laughs> bract, needle. <laughs> you pick up a handful of leaves, uh, uh, you have a hundred million stomata in your hands. <laughs> and what do they do? They open and close. And what they do, they eat carbon for CO2 for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But when they're eating, they release moisture. So they have to really be careful about how long they stay open and under what circumstance. And we've computer model, not we, but scientists have computer model the behavior of stomata, and they know now that they have memory, the guardian cells around the stoma, memory, they can remember the weather going back, detect temperature, humidity. They can hear, huh? Hear the dawn chorus, the birds in the morning, the robins in this case, uh, where I am, at least uh, near High Park, and uh, detect the moisture in the leaf, in the plant, in the roots, and in the soil surrounding the root structure. And with all that, they calculate what time of the day to open, how long to open, and when to close up. So basically what I'm saying here, plants are brilliant, extraordinary, or all photosynthetic processes are. And we've sort of, the IPCC, with all due respect to the IPCC, has said, oh yeah, land, oh, yeah, farms and forests, you know, as if, yeah, there are sinks, but, you know, and what we have to do is make more panels, you know, solar panels. Um, and actually we have to really pay attention to what the Earth does and can do already. Um, the book, you saw the cover, I want to just explain the title. It's so brash and cheeky, and I know that, and I apologize, barely. The most comprehensive plan ever proposed to reverse global warming. The reason we titled that is to make sure you understand that no other plan ever has been proposed to reverse global warming. So we could have said the most nuanced, we could have said the most brilliant, the most colorful plan. No matter what we said, it would be true because there's nothing to compare it to. And why this is true at this point in time, I do not know, but it is so. This is the Rosetta Stone. Actually, it's a simulation of it, it's not the real one. But it's a better photograph, anyway. Um, but language, and all this is about reframing, really. And it's not just about measuring and modeling, what it is about rethinking our relationship to carbon, to uh, the atmosphere, and to each other, our relationships with each other. And the language we're using around climate change is guaranteed to do what it's done, which is to have a very small minority of people be illiterate about it and care about it, and the vast majority going, I'm sorry, I'm out of here. Why? Well, we saw the headlines. Second, we're using uh, terminology which is so arcane for most people. Decarbonization, really? Decarbonization is the name of the problem. It is not the name of the solution, with all due respect. We decarbonize by putting the carbon here up there. That's called decarbonization. So it's a negative term. Then we have negative emissions, another negative term. We're using negative terms to describe what we need to do. And that does not exactly light up people's fire, you know, in imagination. Then, on top of that, at least on the NGO level, and we see it everywhere, we're going to tackle climate change, we're going to fight climate change, we're going to combat climate change, 
We're using war metaphors, war verbs, to actually talk about a relationship to this extraordinary system called the atmosphere, which is our ally and protects us. And the only true boundary on Earth is the atmosphere. It's the only true boundary. Right? And so the fact is, when you use those kind of verbs, you're saying it's other. It's like we're going to fight something. It's the enemy. It's not the enemy. And furthermore, you're saying we're fighting change. Well, good luck. <laughs> Stopping change, combating change, we're going to slash emissions as if we had machetes. I mean, the whole language around it is so uh, hurtful and, and off-putting. And where does that get put the person? Where are we in this? How are we connected? How do we actually give thanks to the atmosphere, <laughs> right? It's, it's extraordinary, right? And, and, and so I, I just want to say that as long as we have that kind of dualism in our language about it, as long as we treat this as a fear-based problem, then we're going to get the results. And we know when you use threat and fear and gloom and doom as a way to try to motivate people, and then you add that that list you saw earlier, which is this is what individuals can do, put a power strip in a home entertainment center and move closer to work. I mean, these things like, and then an individual feels guilty. They may feel shame. They may feel, oh, you know, I have a mortgage, I have kids, uh, my mother's not doing well, you know, I have to take care of her. I mean, they're stressed. And then we put this on them and say, you know, welcome to the world of global warming, good luck. And it produces what? Empathy? No. Apathy. Care? No. Indifference. Enlivening? No. Numbness. You know, it does. It produces the opposite result. And so unless we language this as a opportunity, as a gift really, because every system that ignores feedback dies. This is feedback from a system called the atmosphere. The relationship between physics and biochemistry. Okay, we know them principles. We've known them for a long time. So feedback is our ally. So we have to then reimagine this relationship in such a way that we see it as happening for us, not to us. As long as we think this is happening to us, then we have eschewed responsibility. And two, what happens when you say it's to us? Well, you're a victim, you're the object, something happened to you. Somebody else is responsible. The United States was suing oil companies because they knew about it. In the meeting we had, uh, I thought it was Chatham House, I know it was Chatham House Rules, but wherever it was on the Thames River in this little inn, I mean, I can say without really compromising it too much, I mean, Shell knew about global warming then. So did Philips, so did Conoco, so did Exxon. They all knew about it, they knew it very well. This is not a surprise. They're not stupid, these companies. And so as long as we sort of demonize it, you know, then what is our life like? If we see it as happening for us, that is to say, you take 100% responsibility, it's happening for us. Now what am I going to do? Now I'm going to reimagine the world. I'm going to innovate. I'm going to create. I'm going to think about what it is that we can do at this point in time. And so we have a choice as human beings, as institutions, to go one way or the other. And one way, to me, is interesting and is a good life, and one of them actually is a dead end, it's a cul-de-sac. And so that is really what Drawdown is about, and by mapping and measuring and modeling these solutions and presenting them in such a way that they actually engage people, they go, oh, how interesting, I didn't know, look at that picture. We give antidotes, we give narratives, we give stories. The first solar panel was in 1884 in New York City on a rooftop. Two years before, the first coal-fired power plant was built in the United States as well, in the same city, in New York City. And at that time, they had op opposing editorials as to which would prevail, solar or coal. Of course, solar won. <laughs> it just took a while. When we understand that this is the human story, and that anything humans do, they can undo. They can undo. We can undo this. We can reverse this. And, but we can't do it unless we orient ourselves in such a way that is towards the solutions, towards um, drawing down. And I just want to start with one of our famous American scientists, uh, Matt Damon. Uh, 
And if you didn't see The Martian, spoiler alert, he comes back. I saw him actually a few weeks ago. He didn't see me, but I saw him, that's all. Um, but there's a wonderful scene at the end where he's talking to, you know, wannabe astronauts and he's come back and he's got gray hair and, you know, he's like the wise, the wise one. And he says, and uh, I don't have the, I, I, I'll never be an actor because I couldn't memorize the script, but he said basically, when you go up there, you absolutely, you think you're going to die. It's going to happen to you, no question about it. And when that happens, you have to make up your mind. What are you going to do? Are you going to give up? Or are you going to solve the problem? And he said, to solve the problem, I love this part, he said, you do the math. <laughs> like, ah. You do the math. And you solve one problem, and you solve the next, and then you solve the next one. And if you solve enough problems, you get to come home. And to me, climate change, reversing global warming, is about coming home. That's what it's about. Thank you so much.